Hi, Bulldogs. Uh, this video is a, a quick um, overview on the effects of imperialism. Of course, you know, there's many different examples and many different effects um, throughout many different time periods uh, in the era of imperialism. So there's no way to include all of them, but this sort of gives you guys the big picture. Now, for this video, we're sort of going to do a case study in Africa. Um, the effects were similar, albeit different, um, from imperialism in Asia, South America, even other parts of Europe. And even within Africa, right? Africa is this huge continent. So imperialism in South Africa was different than imperialism in, say, the Congo or maybe Northwest Africa. But this is still like a case study just to give you an overview of it. So we're going to start with the negative effects of imperialism. And this is mostly from the perspective of the people of Africa. Um, there were negative effects for the imperialists as well, which you will see in a next lesson um, for a reading that we do. Now, some of these negative effects were that many of the native nations lost control of their land um, and they lost their independence. They lost their sovereignty. Um, and this uh, resulted in a lot of deaths and injuries and hardships for the people that tried to resist these changes. So these two maps show you in particular um, just how much imperialism was increasing in these decades as the 1800s um, led to the 1900s. Uh, prior to the age of imperialism, most of Europe only really... Um, intervened or communicated with um, Africa as far as South Africa, the North Africa, and just the perimeter, especially like West Africa, um, as uh, countries like Portugal use them as trading ports, um, unfortunately were used uh, in the slave trade, but the interior was not really penetrated very much um, until later on. So some of these negative effects um, you saw already, if you um, saw the John Green video or you did the actively learn, I'm sorry, the facts on file reading, is that Africans and Europeans were fairly immune to each other's diseases because they did have some interaction. It's not like when Europeans first went to South America and the diseases completely decimated people, but there were pandemics um, that each area had that was being spread. Now, um, it says here, disease like smallpox. This image you can tell is not of smallpox. Um, this image is of um, a virus known as Renderpest. It was often called the cattle plague. And in the 1890s, um, this hit Eastern and Southern Africa and it decimated the cattle population. Um, by about 80 to 90% of all cattle were killed. And not only did this cause social problems, but this led to economic problems. Because of all the diseases there, um, Europeans did um, try to step up their game and find drug treatments. However, many of these drug treatments featured things like um, ars that drugs that were arsenic based. And sometimes these drugs killed as many people as the, the disease did. Um, the British also tried things like just carting off certain groups of people so that disease would not spread. So as you look at the pandemic facing us today with the coronavirus, um, it is worthwhile to look at what worked and what did not work during uh, these outbreaks in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Other negative effects were that imperialism broke down traditional cultures of the people being imperialized. Um, all different ways. Um, authority figures of the local areas were often replaced um, by the imperialists for especially the times when it was under direct rule. Um, many times people's homes and their property were transferred to others without really their regard or concern for the people that lived there. There was contempt for traditional culture, um, some ethnocentrism, right? When you judge your when you judge other, other cultures by standards of your own culture. So whereas the European cultures were seen as admirable 
Um, the native cultures were not, and this caused all sorts of identity problems. Um, you know, when they were not upholding the European lifestyle. Also, many of the native languages were lost. Um, linguists say at least 52, but possibly hundreds more of known African languages were lost as a result of imperialism and their attempts to civilize the people of Africa. Um, to this day, if you um, live in Ghana, um, you need to be proficient in English in order to enter high school. Um, so um, as these things um, happened, I want to show you um, an example of this man uh, named Edwin Smith. Edwin Smith was a missionary. Both his parents were missionaries, so therefore he was born in South Africa, uh, but he was British as his parents were, and he studied uh, in school in England as he was older. But then he returned to Africa um, as an anthropologist um, and a linguist. Um, he went to not, what's not just South Africa, but uh, Rhodesia. And what he was, was he was cautious of how missionaries introduced their faith. One of the way native cultures were lost was as these Christian missionaries came to bring Christianity. Um, and there's different ways people can introduce their religion. And he said, if you do it um, by copying all these European ways without letting them maintain some of their native traditions, what will happen someday when your empire falls? Will your religion fall with it? And he's quoted as um, saying, one of the most effective ways to suppress a people is by putting a device that will dis disassociate those people from their God, their spirituality, their cultural, their culture, and their history. So he saw um, the harm that was being done in um, destroying the native culture as imperialism was happening, even if he thought that spreading Christianity was a good thing. He said there could be better ways um, to do it. Um, there was also harmful division of the continent. Um, when Africa was divided and united in some parts by European powers, sometimes rival groups that were maybe rivals for centuries and generations were then united in, under one colony. You see how that can cause problems. Sometimes groups that worked together for many, many years were split. Once again, you can see how that can cause problems. This image here is of the famous Berlin Conference or the Congress of Berlin, which was created to manage the European scramble for Africa. Now, originally, um, this was sort of spearheaded um, by the leader of Germany, but alongside with the leaders of France and Great Britain, seeing that the competition um, amongst European powers in Africa to make sure that it didn't cause more problems um, amongst European powers. And initially it had three main motives, um, to promote freedom of commerce in the basin and the mouths of the Congo, to um, internationalize the rivers um, of the Congo and the Niger River, much like how rivers in Europe were internationalized so that any country could use it, and also, um, the third motive dealt with the formalities of new occupations uh, on the coast. But as we know that the Berlin Conference did beyond those three things and basically carved out Africa for the European powers. Now, this Berlin Conference um, lasted for three months between November of eight, 1884 and February of 1885. It lasted 104 days with just some breaks for the holidays and it was signed the General Act. Um, almost all the countries of Europe signed it, uh, but not including Switzerland. The Ottoman Empire also did. Now, America did attend the Berlin Conference. America did not sign um, this act at the end. What you may notice is who was not invited here. No African countries were involved in what was revol you know, involving their home, um, their land. Uh, by 1900, 
uh, Europe claimed 90% of Africa. Um, but just a few years earlier, 80% of it was still controlled by the locals. Um, so you see a vast change um, in a short amount of time. Now, obviously there are a lot of these negative effects, but were there positive effects? Yeah, there were positive effects. You may notice that as I discussed the positive effects, there's also negative effects associated with those positive effects. Um, some of the positive effects is that it reduced local warfare within Africa. There was also many humanitarian efforts. Um, hospitals were created. And as the AA were created, the lifespans of the people of Africa did increase. Also, schools were created. And as, as schools were created, um, literacy rates improved. But now think, what were the negative effects? Well, we also learned, okay, well, maybe as schools were created, literacy went up but maybe they stopped learning their native languages. Um, so some of the things that were created. Um, these hospitals um, did often help the people of Africa or of the other imperialized lands, but they primarily were to benefit the imperialist or the European nations. I'm gonna give you an example here. In 1930, a French hospital was sent up in Tunisia and they opened up a small maternity ward. However, that maternity ward was only to be used for French women who were there. Now, some people will say that the natives did not want to have births in hospitals. That was a very European thing, but it's still something um, to think about. Um, other infrastructural things that were built, uh, dams, bridges, roads, railroads. Now, these were often for European economic interests, but they did still benefit um, the native peoples in some way. Um, the railroads, for example, were built for three main reasons. Um, to protect their military um, domain amongst the areas, for mining, and to transport cash crops. Um, a lot of coffee, a lot of tea, things like that. Um, mining. Um, Though it may have provided some jobs, it also created its own problems. Uh, as the locals worked in these areas, um, things like tuberculosis increased. As plantation agriculture spread with cash crops, um, new diseases spread, waterborne diseases, mosquito-borne diseases, warm, uh, worm-borne diseases. Um, and from this is from alternating the environments, right? This was once this type of land, and now it was cleared to make cash crops. And they bring um, human um, effects as well. Uh, a little side note, um, I have some number here. Um, in the 1800s, Sub-Sahara Africa had only 50 cities um, with more than 10,000 people. And by 2010, we now know that there's 3,000 of those cities. So you see how those cities are a result of the new telegraph and the railroads um, and all this interconnectedness. Okay, so this is some of those things I was just mentioning um, about all the infrastructure. Um, the railways did start in 1852 um, in Alexandria, Egypt. So I want to show you guys this political cartoon. Normally we spend um, a do now type session going over this, but the political cartoon above um, is the Rhodes Colossus, and it's uh, the subtitle is um, From Cape Town to Cairo. So the image here on the left is an image of the Colossus of Rhodes, one of the ancient wonders of the world. You can go ahead and, and Google it um, about how it used to exist and what it stood for. You may see some similarities with the Statue of Liberty, there's some ways it looks a little bit different in different um, uh, images of it. So this um, political cartoon is a visual pun. So while this is the Colossus of Rhodes, this is the Rhodes Colossus. Think of what the word Colossus, colossal means. Remember for political cartoons, we learned what how size shows power and significance. So why is this called the Rhodes Colossus? Well, Cecil Rhodes, was a British uh, entrepreneur, uh, adventurer, uh, imperialist. And if you look at him, right, often students think he's Hitler because of the mustache, but that's Cecil Rhodes. 
what is he doing, right? He ha he's holding something. What is he holding? What do you think? What is that in his hands? Well, usually every year, uh, quite a few students say it looks like he's um, holding puppet strings. And there's some truth to that. What he's actually holding is telegraph lines. Remember the British, part of their infrastructure was to connect their colonies to get information. So from Cape Town to Cairo, you see his um, bottom foot, his front foot is in uh, Cape Town, South Africa, which was a British colony. And his back foot is in Cairo, Egypt, which is another British colony. And he's connecting the telegraph wires um, to bring that infrastructure uh, to the continent of Africa, bringing light to the darkness, so to speak, bringing power, right? Both literal and figurative and literal in more ways than one. Um, the telegraph um, sort of was bringing it into the next century. But for those of you who said, looks like he's holding puppet strings, that's not wrong either, right? There's symbolism there. How were the Europeans controlling and manipulating the African continent? Okay, there might be some other symbolism, um, some other characteristics you could see here, but this is um, a good one. So, you know, make sure you can analyze the, the point of the size, uh, know the symbolism and things like that. Notice he does have a firearm on him. Um, notice that, yeah, is the shading significant? I'm, I'm not so sure, but something to, to think about. Okay, so I'm going to end this here. Um, like I said, this is a brief overview of the big picture. There were many other negative effects. There were other positive effects. There are many specific instances of both that we can include. Um, but we'll dive into that a little bit more before this unit is over. All right. Hope all is well, everybody.